The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. About nine months ago, Ontario re-elected a progressive conservative government to a second four-year term. And since good democratic practice isn't just something that happens on election day, tonight we're checking in on how well we're doing on the more day-to-day -day elements of our democracy. Then, with tax season upon us, some good advice on how and why you really do need to make a personal budget. It's Wednesday, March 15th, and that's next on The Agenda. We did an episode of this program last week focusing on the state of democracy in the world's largest democracy, India, which is going through some rather undemocratic times these days. But we got an email from a viewer who said, we in Ontario shouldn't be so smug that the state of our democracy could be much improved as well. So we thought, why not look into that too? Joining us for that conversation, in Stouffville, Ontario, Government House Leader Paul Calandra, who is the Progressive Conservative member for Markham Stouffville. Here in our studio, Peter Tabins, who is a former interim leader for the New Democratic Party. He's the MPP for Toronto Danforth. In Clearwater, Florida, Janet Ecker, former Ontario PC Party Cabinet Minister. And back here in Midtown Toronto, Martin Redcon, Ontario politics columnist for the Toronto Star. Uh, the gist of the conversation we're about to have is... Thankfully, unlike south of the border, where there's a great deal of skepticism around elections, we seem to have pretty fair and clean elections up here, and nobody's doubting the outcome of the last many elections in this province. But what about what happens between elections? The state of our democracy between elections. That's what we want to get into. And Mr. Calandra, I'm going to give you a chance to listen to everybody else weigh in, and then you'll have a chance to comment uh, in defense of the government. Peter Tabins, why don't you start us off? Generally speaking, state of democracy in Ontario today. I think it's been weakened, Steve. I think that we've seen the government approach the Constitution, the Charter of Rights, as a, a guideline, as a suggestion, rather than something that needs to be respected. Uh, we see a government that uh, seems to be acting on behalf of very well-connected and influential developers, rather than looking out for the interests of people as a whole. Uh, we see an undermining of civic government in this province, which I think is really problematic. The idea that you would have minority government rule in municipal governments is something that's completely contrary to what we think of as democratic principles. You're referring to Toronto City Council. Well, where the strong mayor powers and the ability to rule with a minority. Right. Uh, that doesn't make any sense if you're committed to democracy. So in those areas, I think there's been a real rollback of democratic rights. Janet Ecker, what would you say? Well, I, I think it's also a bit of a different age, Steve, because Right now, uh, consultation has become defined as you didn't consult if you're not doing what I said to do or what I wanted you to do. Uh, so I think that's one issue that it's becoming more and more polarized on all kinds of issues, not just political issues. Secondly, I think the, the introduction of social media has made it uh, even more difficult uh, because it just feeds a lot of, of uh, con controversy, conflict, etc., and not necessarily, as we all know, not necessarily accurate information. So I think that's the second thing. Um, so, and you have a government at Queen's Park that that is quite activist, that is trying to do big things, and people want big things done. As somebody once said to me um, uh, when I was in government, we were trying to do something, and they said, you know, I can only imagine what it would be like if someone was trying to build the St. Lawrence Seaway today. I mean, it just wouldn't get done. So I think you've got a bit of a, you know, a government that's trying to do things because the public wants that. And the other issue, too, is that the accountability, I think, is really, really important. And, and, and Peter made a comment about the strong mayor system in Toronto. One of the challenges with what the system was before is you would have a mayor run, you know, asking for votes across the city, would promise to do something, and then he or she had to go to a council where, you know, there could be a whole bunch of people there that had no interest in the mayor's agenda. So three, four years later, the mayor says, hi, here I am. What do you think? How do you think I did? How do you judge whether he or she was able to deliver on their, their platform, right? So I think structure, I think in, uh, environment, the social factors that we're all dealing with, I think are all contributing to a sense that maybe, you know, that there may be a problem with democracy. All right, lots to follow up there as well throughout the course of our conversation. Martin Redcon, come on in and tell us how you see it. 
Well, Janet's right about the pressure points on democracies around the world, whether it's India or Ontario. I don't think you can compare the two. I think India is a, is, is a much more complex situation where there's a real breakdown between parties. In Ontario, I don't see the breakdown between parties. I think you'll see Mr. Kalander and Mr. Tavins speaking in a relatively civil way to each other. I want to quibble with one thing Janet said. Uh, the, the, the Ford government said one thing and did another uh, on the green belt on the charter of rights and and so there was a, there was in fact this awful cliche a hidden agenda that applies to this government but that's not a breakdown of democracy that happens often in elections and af in post election environments so that's just one thing i want to park i do want to quibble with the premise of your question as the politicians like to say uh, in which you say that, there, that no one is contesting the election I haven't heard Mr. Tavins contest the outcome of the election, but I have heard a lot of, of partisans and activists, people who are sincerely engaged in democracy, questioning the legitimacy of Doug Ford's mandate after the last election because the election turnout was so low. I mean, I think you, you would like to say that it's not just elections, it's between elections that count. I think people, a lot of people in Ontario are hung up about the outcome of the last election because of the low voter turnout. And I disagree with that interpretation. I believe the Ford government won fair and square, and I suspect that Mr. Tabins would agree that he wouldn't contest that outcome. But I just want to park that as one other element that's in the background. It's the elephant in the room here. You'll hear people constantly say he got 41% of only a 43.5% turnout. Ergo, he has less than a 20% of Ontarians behind. That's not how our system works. Mm. Uh, however, I completely agree with Mr. Tavin's analysis uh, on, on the Charter of Rights um, suspensions, uh, suspending Charter Rights by using the notwithstanding clause in yeah. an egregious and an unnecessary way on, on third-party advertising and threatening to use it to take away collective bargaining rights. And yes, Mr. Tavins is absolutely right about the topsy-turvy intervention at City Hall. I support strong mayor powers. However, I do not support minority rule where you can win a vote with by losing a vote. So over to you. Okay. Well, in fact, over to Paul Calandra. We've got a senior minister from this government here who's just been... Uh privy to lots of advice uh, that uh, you and 100,000 other Ontarians are listening to at the same time. Uh, go ahead, fire away. Wh wh what would you say is the state of Ontario democracy today, given all you've heard? Yeah, look, I, I think it's uh, it's healthy, stable, and most importantly, it's it's ever evolving. I think uh, where you start to see uh, democracies in decline is when you think you've got it perfect, right? And if you look at all of the changes that have made in, in Queen, at Queen's Park, uh, uh, not just over the last uh, number of, uh, of years, but uh, uh, over the last uh, over 150 years. Look, in the last uh, in the last parliament, we made changes to standing orders. There's less use of time allocation, and we're we're debating things more often. We're getting committees are on the road uh, are on the road more often. We're passing more private members bills than we ever have uh, uh, have before. Uh, our committee rooms, for the first time, each of our committee rooms is actually. Uh, 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 televised. They have cameras in all the rooms, and people from all over the province can participate uh, in, uh, in in providing advice uh, uh, to the government. Look, when I, I don't see policy disagreements uh, as uh, indications of a weak democracy. I think just the opposite. I think when we disagree on policy, it is a, a an indication of a very healthy and vibrant uh, uh, parliament. And when I look in particular at what we accomplished, uh, and I don't mean this we as a government, but what the Ontario legislature accomplished uh, in the last parliament. Look, we were the only parliaments, and it's not written about a lot, but we were the only parliaments that continued to sit in person, that found a way to vote in person in a safe uh, in a safe manner. Our committees continued. We continued to provide budgets. Uh, you know, we, we provided a, a budget in, in, in March of 20, uh, 2020 uh, that had opposition input on it, uh, that saw us remove a few things that they weren't happy with, but then we came out together uh, unified. So I look at uh, at it and say, look, we are on a, a, a strong path in the province of Ontario. And I, look, I'm optimistic even across the country, whether it's the federal parliament and municipal parliaments. I think, I think uh, it is a vibrant, healthy democracy here in Canada, and we should be very, very proud of that. Okay, Minister, let me do one quick follow-up with you before I get a second round in with everybody else. And, and I'll just pluck one of the things that has been mentioned so far, and that is, in 40 years, no government in the province of Ontario ever used the notwithstanding clause of the Constitution to set aside constitutionally protected charter rights 
But this government has done it a couple of times and tried to do it more than that. For those who believe that that is not consistent with democratic governance in the province of Ontario, what would you say? Well, look, I'll say this. I know there's a lot of talk of the charter and, and what the uh, uh, what they envisioned when they brought it in. Look, when the charter was brought in, there were no cell phones. There were no computers in every home. Uh, most Canadians didn't have uh, uh, cable, uh, cable TV. Most had one phone in their house. We still had smoking on planes and in restaurants. It is a very different time frame uh, when the Constitution was drafted to where it is today. The courts weren't as active when, uh, uh, when uh, activists, when the... Uh, the charter was uh, was was brought in, so the, it is evolving. It is always evolving, but the system is there. A, there is a notwithstanding clause. The, the provinces have utilized that, but the courts have also stepped in when they have disagreed with the, a province's use of it, and that's where we're at today. So it it is it is hard for me to uh, to to uh, uh, to hear sometimes when people say, "Well, you know, you're using uh, a constitutionally." Uh, a provision in the Constitution, but it's not the way it was. It was uh, it, they considered it? Well, a Constitution is not meant to be uh, 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 unamendable, unmovable. That's why they brought in the notwithstanding clause, and that's why provinces are using it, perhaps more often. But we have evolved so much since the 1980s. This is not. There's there was no such thing as social media back in the 1980s. Canada Post is how you communicated. Uh, I remember sitting in my living room with my family, you know, having to call Italy and you got 15 seconds on the telephone because it was so expensive. So things have changed so much. So, you know, provinces are going to continue to use this and the courts will continue to do their job in, uh, in, uh, in assessing whether it is the, the valid use of it. Let's follow up on that. Peter Tabins, I mean, it is a fair thing to point out that the Court of Appeal in Ontario just, you know, basically overturned the Ford government's use of the notwithstanding clause. They said, not only do we disagree, but you can't use it going forward on this particular election expenses thing as well. Does he have a point that the, the clause is in there to be used and therefore governments are using it more? Uh, I don't think he has a point, frankly. Uh, the understanding that I have is the clause was put in for very unusual and extreme situations, not meant to be used on a regular basis to deal with problems the government is facing on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Frankly, we've got a government that doesn't think that fundamental rights around electoral participation or bargaining are of consequence and is quite prepared to use the notwithstanding clause to ignore any constitutional challenge. Well, they tried to use it in the case of the labor negotiations and then they stood down when they got yeah, heat. Yeah, no, they got a huge amount of heat because people were outraged by it. And not just people in the trade union movement, people across the spectrum were saying, you've got to be kidding me. You're going to overturn these people's rights in this way without respecting what they fundamentally have a right to have access to. I, I think that the government is reaching on this. We're given all kinds of extraneous reasons as to why we should be able to use the, the notwithstanding clause. But if you actually respect the charter and people's rights, this is not something that you use as casually as this government does. You use it in very limited and extreme circumstances. That's not the case here. Let's remember can that I, can when I jump, we... Can I jump in, Steve? But sure, go just ahead. Very briefly, first, uh, on the behalf of uh, Mr. Calander, with all respect, um, you're, you're on this panel, you're slightly outnumbered because you've got Janet Ecker, Steve Pagan, and me who covered Bill Davis, the late Bill Davis, who spoke out against the Charter, a great progressive conservative, I'm sure you'd agree. Spoke out against the use of the notwithstanding clause. Uh, uh, thank you. And, it's, it's, yes. it, the, 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 and, and the reason he didn't like the usage of it was it seemed like a trivial usage of it in the times that Mr. Ford has invoked it, as I'm sure you know. Look, there, there is a decent argument an arguable case for having a notwithstanding clause. A great new Democrat, Mr. Tabins, Mr. Tabins, uh, Alan Blakeney, fought strongly for uh, having letting the legislators have the final say. Mm. But in this case, what what it, what grates is that it's being used in an arbitrary way by the yeah. Ford government, in particular on third-party advertising, where the where the previous Liberal government had a very decent compromise on third-party advertising. Let's control it six months before an election, and the Ford government out of nowhere said. No, let's double that to 12 months. So it was everything is capricious in this particular uh, discussion on, on the charter, and that's what I think is concerning for many people. Well, let's remember here that when we talk democracy in the province of Ontario, we're not just talking about the government, but we're talking about the opposition parties as well. They are part of our democracy. And to that end, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up the first graphic here. Democracy Watch is an organization that keeps an eye on this kind of stuff. And frankly, it doesn't love much of what it sees down at Queen's Park. 
It has graded the political parties in terms of their adherence to democratic principles. Not surprisingly, the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party gets an F from Democracy Watch, but, but the NDP get a D, the Liberals get a D, and the Green Party only gets a C-. And if we further look at what Democracy Watch has had to say, uh, when they look at the PC party and some of their issues with it, a refusal to disclose cabinet ministers' mandate letters, the creation of Ontario News Now, which was kind of a fake news service they created in their first term. There was an attempt to appoint the Premier's friend, Ron Tavener, to head the OPP, despite his being unqualified for the job. And as we've already discussed, the use of the notwithstanding clause to set aside charter rights. So uh, when you look at the state of democracy, Janet Ecker, I'll get you in first on this one. When you look at this report card, it, it seems that everybody could take a few lessons here. Is that fair to say? Well, listen, at least they're being even-handed, right? They're saying every, nobody's good at it. Um, but I think one of the points, to get back to one of the earlier points, one of the things that has changed, I think, in the balance, because democracies are all about balance. It's about brokering deals, if I can put it that way, or consensus between different parties, et cetera. Everybody has to put a little bit of water in their wine, the more complicated society gets. And one of the problems with the courts these days is that judges may be really, really good at balancing legal issues. They're not necessarily as good at judging or balancing social and political issues. And there's no accountability. I mean, if Minister Calandra and his colleagues makes a decision around notwithstanding, um, they stand up and defend that, and the voters are going to say yay or nay come the next election. That's the way the system should work. Um, where if the judge, what do you do? And what has been happening is that the activist court has been whittling away slowly but surely not, and it's not a plot or anything like that, but whittling away slowly and surely about, uh, on government's levers to be accountable, to do things. So for example, you're looking at, at very, um, you can understand the pressures and the, and the, uh, the public sector unions are pushing very hard for, for big wage increases. Okay, there's a bargaining process, all of that. Um, but the government's losing the ability to say, wait a minute, yes, you, you deserve more pay, but we also have to be fair to the taxpayers who are paying for that. And let's look at your benefits, let's look at your wages, and are you consistent with what's happening out there in the private sector, etc. So there's a lot of things that the government needs to balance in that process. The judges have not, and, and they don't particularly. I mean, they're, and they're different. I mean, I'm generalizing here. But I think that's been one of the other pieces of this debate that is complicating um, the ability of governments to be accountable. They have to deal with courts that don't have to be accountable to no, the people I take at your, the end of the day I, and vote. I take your point on that, and, let, and I think we've got a good kick at the, the whole issue of the judiciary and the look of the notwithstanding clause. So let me pluck one of the things off that list we just shared that comes from Democracy Watch. And Minister Calandra, maybe I'll get you to comment first on this. For example, when you get appointed to cabinet, you get a mandate letter from the premier. And the premier says, here's what I expect of you. Now, federally, the prime minister has made those mandate letters public. The premier, in his wisdom, in Ontario, has decided not to make them public. And despite the fact that people have gone to court to try to get them to be made public, he holds firm to that position. Uh, you know, if you believe that transparency is uh, the best disinfectant, what's the expression? Disinfectant. Disinfectant. Uh, what's the issue with making that stuff public? Look, uh, Steve. <laughs> I love this debate on, on the mandate letters. Uh, look, I think our mandate is pretty clear. We want a, an election on uh, on what uh, uh, on the things that we want to accomplish over the next four years. We have budgets. Uh, we bring in legislation which highlights the things that we want to, to focus on. But when I hear some of this discussion about you know uh, you know whether it's Democracy Watch or, or others who, who suggest that somehow uh, the state of, of democracy is in, is in decline in the province of Ontario, I fundamentally disagree. And I disagree on behalf of all of the people that sit in that chamber. Because, you know, uh, whether it is the government side or the opposition side, there is vigorous, vigorous debate on a whole host of, of items that come before us. Uh, and in particular, like when you look at the last parliament during COVID, an opposition that had to balance moving things forward with also providing opposition or suggestions, it was done effectively effectively, remarkably well by the uh, by the opposition. Uh, they continue to be an effective uh, opposition. The government continues to move forward with its its mandate. I think sometimes people focus on the little parts, on, on the on, on question period, and not on what happens in committees. The quality of debate that happens throughout the day uh, 
at uh, at Queens Park. The discussions that members have uh, when they're uh, when they're not in the chamber. When you look in the chamber during a day, uh, you see members on their computers answering emails, doing constituency work. We are moving forward in this in this province. So, do we have disagreements on policy? Obviously, obviously. But what what a boring place it would be if we didn't, if we didn't have spirited uh, debate. So uh, I, I always push back on anybody who says that you can't accomplish something in the Ontario legislature, uh, that uh, somehow we're not effective. Both sides, whether you're in opposition or in government, whether you're an independent in the province of Ontario, you have an opportunity to participate. And everybody has been doing it. Like, I've been very proud, not that it's my uh, uh, job to be, uh, you know, not that anybody cares if I'm proud of how uh, how members uh, are uh, work hard, how hard they're working. Sorry, but we have done a really good job in the province. Of okay, Ontario. let me jump in for a second here. Let me jump in because I, uh, I want to do one more kick at this mandate letter thing. I know you think it's inside baseball, but the reality is, uh, for for some people, it's an issue, and and surely there's got to be something more to a government's mandate than simply get it done. What's wrong with making the mandate letters public? I mean, look, we we we. It is it well, clear? I'm the minister of long-term care. I have a mandate to build 60,000 new and upgraded beds. I bring in legislation. I have a mandate to improve nursing uh, or uh, to get to four hours of care. I'm bringing legislation to do that. I ran, ran on a platform in the uh, in the uh, in the last election. The government has a budget which outlines where it wants to go. So at every step of the way, people are, have a full understanding of where we're going and what we want to do. This isn't the first government that hasn't put its mandate letters uh, uh, made its mandate letters uh, available. Uh, and look, there are many, many opportunities for people to understand where we're going as a government, what we want to accomplish as a government, and to have their say, whether it's the opposition in the House or the public at election time. Peter Tabbins. Yeah, I, I, do you know, frankly, people deserve to know what instructions ministers have been given. Yes, governments, parties run on platforms, they make promises, they make commitments. But when you come to actually telling people what they have to do and what they have to deliver, those mandate letters are important. And if you're going to have a functioning democracy, everybody needs to know what the instructions are, what the rules are in the game. And when this government withholds those mandate letters, I don't know what instructions were given to uh, Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs. It would be very useful to see. Was he told to ignore the green belt commitments that were made by the government prior to the election or not? I think that withholding those mandate letters undermines democracy, undermines the transparency that people need to be effective in a democracy. Well, since you brought up the green belt, let's go there next. And again, we're, we're going can to have I, a discussion. Just quickly jump, jump oh, in. Martin, I'm running out of time here. I'm running out of time. I'm going to go to you I, next. Because I can answer. Because I can answer your questions uh, both on the. Because no one has answered the questions on the mandate letters. Of course, the government should let should, should release them as the as the previous Liberal government did, as the federal government did, because then people would stop talking about mandate letters. Because I read them. <laughs> I read them in the Wind government, and I read them from the Trudeau government. Whenever we have a guest or interview a federal or provincial minister, I I read those mandate letters and they are almost irrelevant and I think Peter answered his own question when he said when he asked was Steve Clark given instructions to cancel the green belt we need to know well the answer is yes of course because he has carved up the green belt and as for platforms opposition platforms which also your, was your question which went unanswered uh, absolutely I think actually democracy watch was unfair because they gave the opposition better marks than the Tories all three and a half parties, if you include, include the Greens, had platforms that were embarrassing. I mean, we went from Buck a Beer, which was a gifted to us by Mr. Calandra's party, to Buck a Ride with the Liberals, and, and the NDP saying they were going to reduce auto insurance rates by 40% without saying how they would do that after they previously promised they would buy back Hydra One, and then, oops, never mind. So the platforms are, are a disgrace. But democracy lives on, as Mr. Calandra says. And and what I would say is that this government, unlike the federal uh, conservatives, still maintains a, a modicum of civility in its interactions with parties. Okay. The, the word green belt was mentioned, so let's go yeah. there now. And uh, Janet Ecker, you, uh, when you're not in Florida, you live in Durham Region, and that's where some of the green belt controversy is taking place, along with York Region. Let me just state for the record right now, I got a brother who's a home builder, although not in York or in Durham, so it, this is not an issue in terms of um, his involvement there. Uh, but I, I would ask Janet Ecker, given, given everything that's been in the news over the last many months, about changing the green belt boundaries and allowing building in the green belt and putting other lands that weren't in the green belt into the green belt and developers at stag and doe dinners and this kind of thing. 
Does it raise for you questions about the legitimacy of decisions made by the provincial government? No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. They're the government. They were elected to do things that they promised to do, and they will be judged at the end of the day whether people think they did, you know, they did it appropriately or not. But one of the challenges with the, the Greenbelt concept was that there's been so many political changes and tweaks to the land in, under previous administrations, um, you know, and when it was set up originally, I mean, in my riding, it was very controversial because there was land that was included that was was uh, really good agricultural land that should be continued. But on the other hand, there was land that, that should have been in and that wasn't. And where was the policy uh, s established to decide what should and shouldn't be protected? Again, there's a, it was a parcel of land in my riding called the Agriculture Preserve. There was another parcel of land that was scheduled for development. And I was told by, you know, constituents, very it was all very controversial. But the ag land that was supposedly protected was worse quality ag land than the land that, that uh, was going to be built on. So I think part of the fundamental problem when we set up the Green Belt and when administrations are trying to deal with it is what, is the, what are the policy reasons for this piece versus that piece? And I think that's a legitimate debate. And I think the government um, you know, is, is wrestling to try and find the right balance here by saying, OK, maybe we'll take this for development. Maybe we'll put this much more in under protection. But what are the rules around doing that? What are the scientific or the environmental uh, rules that are causing a policy decision to be made on that? And I think that's the one thing that gets lost a little bit in this debate. Um, but we know we need housing. Uh, there's no easy way to, to, uh, to deal with the immigration that we're going to see in the GTA, to deal with the growth of population. Um, and those places have to go somewhere. So it's always going to be a controversial decision. Uh, Minister Calandra, I should get you to, and again, we're, we're trying to place this discussion in the context of whether it's bad for democracy in the province of Ontario. And to set the question up, I'll say there is no evidence to date that I know of that your government gave a heads up to developers to allow them to uh, purchase land that was in the green belt. The suspicion being with a foreknowledge that the land would be moved out of the green belt and they therefore would be allowed to develop on it. But again, it looks bad. The optics are bad. There are people alleging malfeasance. What do you think incidents like this say about the state of democracy in the province? Uh, look, uh, on the specific to the policy issue, uh, uh, we've made it very clear since 2018 that we were going to do everything in our power to ensure that there were more houses built in the province of Ontario. So we've had pieces of legislation every single year that we've been in office. Circumstances have obviously changed quite a bit given the amount of, uh, of immigration that we are we want to have in the province of Ontario. We're actually asking for more, frankly. Uh, and given the challenges that we're having building houses, the time frames, so circumstances have changed. We need to build these homes and get it done faster. But all of these bills, they're brought before the House. There is vigorous debate in the Legislative uh, uh, Assembly on each of the bills that we brought, including Bill uh, Bill 23 and, and all of the measures that we're taking with respect to the Green Belt. It's before the House. It's before committee. The legislature has an opportunity to, to provide input. Uh, but again, the government's been very clear really since 2018, Steve, on this. We might need to build more housing. We need to build it faster. And that we are going to move heaven and earth to get that done for the people of the province of Ontario. Peter Tavins. Yeah, we're in a situation, Steve, where we've had a government promise over a number of years consistently that they weren't going to touch the Green Belt. And then after an election in which the Green Belt was not an issue because everyone understood the government's commitment, here's a government moving against these protected lands when we know we have the land in the Greater Golden, Golden Horseshoe to provide hundreds of thousands, over a million homes. We don't need to touch the Green Belt. I know you, I know you don't like the policy that they have chosen here, but the question of whether it is anti-democratic, that's think, what I'm interested in. Well, I, I think when you have a situation in which it appears that influential insiders are doing extraordinarily well from a government decision, a government decision that was totally unexpected given the public position of the government, that undermines people's confidence in democracy. You say appears, though. There's no evidence only, yet. Well, I don't have evidence. If I had evidence, I'd be talking to the OPP. <laughs> uh, so I, I would say um, the Integrity Commissioner is going to be looking at this. The OPP has been looking to see if there is, in fact, evidence. The problem, fundamentally, in my mind, is that let's say there is no evidence. Even the appearance of an intervention by influential 
insiders to reshape the government's policies is something that undermines people's confidence in democracy. That is a substantial problem. Martin, would you agree with that, that, that although no illegality has been proven here or any evidence found of it, it doesn't look good and that's enough to question people's faith in democracy? Do you think that's fair? It not only doesn't look good, it, we, don't, we don't know the facts. In fact, uh, Democracy Watch and others have said that there's no proof. The point is that there is proof that the government lied when Doug Ford said, first, I'm going to develop the Green Belt in a private conversation yeah. in 2018, and then publicly reversed himself and reassured people. Okay, well, hang on, That's hang on. I don't, like, I, I, I don't like the word lie. A lie suggests that, that there's a, you know, a, a previous state a of mind, it, like a malfeasance. He may have just simply changed his mind. I mean, that's allowed in politics. Yeah, and, for, and forgot to tell the voters in, 20, in, in 2022, just a, a two months before he uh, changed his mind. So I would, I would call that a lie because, because he said he wouldn't do it, and then within days of saying he wouldn't do it, he did it. So, but that's the problem. I mean, look, the public and the media love the smell of corruption. And, and the point is, let's not get sidetracked by what is not yet, but, but we don't have any facts on that. What we do know is, is a lack of credibility, and therefore that undermines the entire initiative. There is an arguable case on, on adjusting the Green Belt. It has been adjusted 17 plus times in the past. It's not Jasper National Park. It's a ring around the Green Belt, around the GTA that's worth preserving. But I think Mr. Ford and the, and the Tories lost credibility on this, and that undermines the entire enterprise. Minister Calandra, you want to comment on that? Oh, look, I, I honestly, I, I fundamentally disagree. I, 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 we are in a situation in this province, and I hear you, Mr. Tavinzo, we, we have more than enough land. Uh, we need that land and more. We are welcoming at least 300,000 people to the province of Ontario each and every year, and frankly, we need, need more than that. We have to be able to give those people the same thing that generations have had before, the opportunity to have their first home. Uh, and we're building that. We're doing that. Circumstances have changed in, the, in this country, in this province, between 2018 and today. People are having a very, very difficult time in order in finding that first, that first home. And we've done a lot of the other work, you know, transit-oriented communities, and more has to be done. Uh, but that's what happens in a, in a vibrant democracy, right? You bring these plans forward, you bring it to the legislature, and you let the members have their say. You let the public have their say, and that is what is being done. And, and look, I may disagree with, with Martin, I may disagree with, uh, with, uh, with Peter, but I actually think it is exactly what you expect to happen in a vibrant democracy. Uh, and and I'm, I'm actually proud of the fact that we have that. The fact that people are, can protest in front of Queen's Park and that they still want to is a very, very good thing. It shows the health of our democracy. And, you know, I'm encouraged by it. Policy differences, fine. We're going to have that. That's always going to be a, a factor in, the, in, in, in public discourse. But I think overall, the state of, of democracy in the province of Ontario, and frankly, across this country, is something that we should be quite proud of. Well, let me pick up on that in our last minute here. And Peter Tavins, I'll go to you on that. Uh, we heard uh, Minister Calandra talk about us having a vibrant democracy. He talked about the health of our democracy. Uh, you won't be surprised with a that a guy with a book about John Turner is going to quote him uh, in the last minute here, which is to say, John Turner, you say democracy doesn't happen by accident. You've got to participate. And I'm going to come full circle here back to MRC's comment about the fact that 43% of the people voted in the last general election. And there's a by-election in Hamilton tomorrow in which, I don't know, I'm guessing 25% of the people are going to vote. Might not even be that high. Can you say we've got a vibrant, healthy democracy if there is so little participation happening right now? That's a really good question, Steve. Uh, when people feel discouraged, uh, when they feel that there is no hope to actually affect the outcome, then they tend to stay away. I have to say, by-elections are a special case. By-elections historically have had very low turnout, so I don't think there will be a big change in Hamilton. But, but I think what we're seeing in Ontario, and I pick it up at the door as a a feeling of people, we don't have an opportunity to actually affect the course of this government. And I think that that was reflected in what happened in the last uh, general election here But the in biggest chunk of people re-elected this government twice. So, but I, I'm, I'm looking for a, a, a sort of a, a more overarching comment, I guess, about whether or not you can really say we're healthy when there's so little I participation. When people feel discouraged and stay away from the electoral process, the democratic process, then yes, things are not healthy. Gotcha. I want to thank everybody for participating in this conversation, which I thought was very democratically handled here.
Paul Calandra, the government house leader, joining us from Stouffville this evening. Peter Tavins, the new Democrat member of provincial parliament for Toronto Danforth. Janet Ecker, the only smart one among us because she's in Florida right now. Uh, she's the former PC cabinet minister. And Martin Regcon, whose columns you can read in the Toronto Star. Thanks so much, everybody, for participating. There are lots of helpful adages about how to manage your money. Pay yourself first. Don't spend more than you earn. Put away enough for a rainy day. You've heard them all before. But even better, say those in the know, make a personal budget and stick to it. Advisors say, I see heads nodding here already. Advisors say it's amazing how many people don't do that. It's not as daunting a task as you may think, and here to help simplify it, and maybe even inspire you to take the plunge, we're joined by Kingsley Chack. He is Senior Vice President, Deposits, Savings, and Investments at Scotiabank. Stephanie Wolf, Certified Financial Coach and Founder of Wolf Collective Wealth. And Shea Myers, Licensed Financial Educator and Creator of the online educational platform, Finance for the Culture. Great to have you three with us here at the table here. I'm going to start with just some numbers here that I'm sure all of you know, which are somewhat terrifying, but let's do these anyway. Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up? This is the best and most recent data on the financial habits of Canadians. It comes from 2019, the Financial Capability Survey, which found about half of Canadians have a budget, which of course means half don't. 20% of those who do budget report using a digital tool, such as a spreadsheet or an app, and Canadians who do budget are 10 percentage points more likely to make progress on their debt. All right, with that as our foundation for our discussion, uh, who am I going to go to first here? Stephanie, why do so few people budget? I think a lot of it actually comes down to the emotional framing of thinking about what a budget is. A lot of people think, oh my God, a budget means that I can't spend money. And it's sort of a reduction spend, right? And I want people to reframe that and think about it in a different way. It's a spending plan so that you can get control of your money. So instead of whittling away and thinking about how little do I actually have, flip that on its head and think about it as a spending plan. Tell us about that 50% that don't budget. Why don't they make out a budget? I think a lot of people don't know where they actually are. And so, or they're wrapped up in their past, past horrible spending habits, and they don't know how to move forward. I think a lot of people lack guidance as well. And so, let's say someone is, for example, in a lot of debt or has horrible spending habits, they don't really know the first step to move forward, and so they just avoid it altogether. What do you say? I think it's the intimidation factor. Right. Intimidation. The intimidation. People think that I need a big spreadsheet, I need to track everything, it's mm -hmm. going to be tough, it's challenging. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of tools right now that you, you do it every day and it's actually simple. The, I think the first step is having a conversation, starting a budget and, and getting started is, is really the first step. Tell me more about that conversation, Kingsley, because, uh, okay, you're talking to a client. The client doesn't budget. They yeah. don't know how to budget. How do you start that conversation with them to get them on the path? Yeah, the, the first step is what's your goal? What do you try to achieve and what do you, what do you want to do? Uh, once that is defined, then really looking at your spending pattern Right? And so nowadays in, you know, at Scotiabank and, and a lot of other banks have personal tools in your mobile app that help you to, to look at your spending. And they automatically categorize it so you don't need to, every spend you go, go to your phone and lock it down. You don't need to do that anymore. Every month and every day you can look at how much you have spent and making those simple and easy to follow you know, we talk about only 50% budget. How, how many people actually stick with the budget and follow through? Probably a much lower amount. Right. Mm -hmm. When you're talking finance for the culture and you want to get people on a budget, how do you start? How do I start? So I get to know them. I get to know what their current uh, spending habits are. And I also, just like you said, goal setting as well. Like, where are you and where do you want to go? So I do something called a financial analysis where I look at their cash flow. So what is coming in on a monthly basis and what is going out? And Those numbers the, should have some relationship to one another. <laughs> yes. They? Yeah. And um, also, if they have disposable income at the end of every month, where is that going or how can we properly allocate that? And then if they don't, like if they're in the red, we need to look at their expenses, right? Like. 
Are you overspending in some area? Or honestly, sometimes the cold hard truth is that you need to make more money, but the financial analysis is going to reveal all of that. Gotcha. Stephanie, how does the conversation start with you? Well, for me, I think it comes back to the relationship. I think money is a very emotional topic, and mm -hmm. we were sort of alluding to that um, just a couple of minutes ago, but I think starting with what's important to them first. I think defining, you know, we talk about the goals, but I think it's understanding what your relationship is with money, and if somebody does have money behaviors that maybe don't sound very healthy. Like it's what? Identif maybe overspending, perhaps in areas where they shouldn't be. Identifying those triggers. What is driving the emotional um, feeling for you to want to overspend in certain you areas? You have that conversation. I do. So that's very, it's... you're more psychologist than banker <laughs> at that point, aren't Before you? Before you even get into the money conversation, I think it's really important to define what your values are and what's important mm -hmm. to you before you set those goals. Because mm -hmm. it becomes too black and white and it can be a little bit difficult to make that emotional change. It's about those tiny habits, right? Okay. Time Tiny habits. Shay, how do you tell somebody you don't have the income to be spending eight bucks a day on latte, <laughs> so stop it? So the financial analysis will reveal that. It literally say, based on your income, based on your expenses, this is how much you have at the end of every month, or this is how much you don't have. And you know, you, I like balance. I want people to enjoy balance. So focus on your financial goals, but also um, enjoy life. But I made a TikTok about this the other day, honestly, and I said, look, sometimes you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford to do both, you have to make a decision of what is a priority. Mm -hmm. And that's just what it is. I, um, I do bring a bit of tough love to, you know, my clients because I want them to see, like, a change has to be made. And sometimes the answers are literally, like you just said, black and white. And so if it is a situation where you can't afford to have Starbucks every single week, you probably already know that, but I'm just here to tell you it again and then also provide you with the backup of the numbers that you can't do it, at least not right now. Right? Well, okay, Kingsley, money is, how do I put this? Money is still, uh, in many respects, one of those taboo subjects in society, right? We're not supposed to ask anybody how much money they make and we're not supposed to ask people how much they paid for that house or what's your rent or, there's lots of stuff we don't talk about. Right. Is that, uh, should we try to do something about that and make money less taboo a topic? Yeah, I think, you know, as, as Stephanie said, money is very emotional, right? It's very personal, but at the same time, it's also facts and numbers, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, starting with a budget, the first step is really be honest to yourself and talk about this. And when you talk to an advisors, those conversations are, are private and you have your privacy protected. Um, and, and uh, but it could be sometimes uncomfortable, but that's, that's kind of the intimidating factor a little bit mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, it's not comfortable, I don't want to talk about it, and, and mm -hmm. taking the first step to reach out to someone and having a conversation, or you even look at your expenses last month and just looking at it and see, and see where you spend. I think that's, those are one of the really good first steps, and, and you know, people should feel more comfortable talking about it and talk to your friends about it. I, I have conversation with, with my friends and say, hey, how do you save money? What, what are you seeing? And, and those, those discussions. You ask your friends how much money they make? Not, not explicitly, <laughs> but, but we do talk about, we do talk about uh, you, know, you know, right now, I think a lot of Canadians' mind is inflation, right? Groceries prices are going up, rent is going up, uh, and it's tougher and tougher. We talk about that. We talk about how, how, how do you plan to save your money, where do you invest money, how, how much of your percent of your income that you're putting on saving, how much you're spending. So in percentage term, you don't need to think about the, the absolute number. That right. makes the conversation easier. And people know those numbers? They can talk about those numbers off the top of their head? Sometimes. Sometimes. Right? And so, like, you know, I have friends that will know, yeah, we, we make, make a plan and save 20% of our income. Right? And, and so that was, oh, maybe I need to think about, is it 20%, 25%, what is right for, for me? And uh, all those are very personal. Shay, mm -hmm. can you actually have that conversation with your friends as in, how much money do you make? How much are you saving? How much are you spending? Can you ask those questions? Um, it's tricky. <laughs> Long it's pause tricky. There. Yes, <laughs> it's tricky because, you know, it's so interesting. When I got into this field, um, I knew some of that information already from my friends because we're friends and we talk about that and, and you know, we have those transparent conversations. But um, now that I'm an advisor, it's like they don't want to talk about money necessarily. Maybe they feel like I might know more than them or I might judge them, but... 
That's it, really, isn't it? It's yeah, judging. Yeah, it's the judge. And, and it's, I always remind people, like, I started off just like you. My spending habits were trash at one point. You know, I had debt, I horrible credit score, and I evolved. So everybody can do it as well. Tell us more. What, what, what was, what, tell some of the stupid stuff you spent money on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, clothes. Clothes, shoes, outside food. Um, Uber Eats had a hold on me. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would spend probably 90% of my paycheck on, well, I would spend 90% of my paycheck the day I got my paycheck. So it was bad. Okay, you not only broke the habit, but you're now in a position to advise others on how to yes. do it. So how, how did you do it? Um, I got an advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so I you know, met someone who was educating people on how money worked, and I listened and I applied it, and I was able to achieve a lot in a very short period of time. And it was a mindset switch, though. So not only did I learn actually how money worked, but I had someone who actually cared about me and cared about my, my dreams and my goals outside of the financial um, spectrum, hmm. and who also made it relatable. So that's now what I focus on. I focus on helping people build a foundation, but making talking about money fun and relatable. I use analogies. You know, I make comparisons to celebrity, you know, things that are going on in the celebrity world. Go ahead, hit me with one. And, um, okay, well, <laughs> are we ready to talk about life insurance? Because uh, that's, that's, you know, something that people don't want to talk about, but we're seeing that certain celebrities are passing away with nothing, no life insurance, no wills, and their families are essentially left with financial burden. Hmm. And so bringing those topics to everyday people, you know, and helping them understand those things. And also just like, I use humor to talk about money because I like to laugh and I also retain more information when I'm enjoying myself. So that's how I make talking about money fun. Gotcha. Yes. Can you have these kinds of conversations with your friends? As in, how much do you make? How much are you saving, etc.? With my friends? Some. It depends on the relationship, mm. I would say. Some of them I can, some of them I can't. And it's something that I wish wasn't as taboo, and that's something that, you know, personally, as a financial counselor, that's something I'd love mm. to break. But mm. I think that's, you know, things that Shay has touched on. That's why people do work with a, a wealth coach or a wealth advisor, is because they want to be able to have somebody help guide them. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish that more people would do it, because sometimes you just need that accountability and that support outside that will help you move the needle just a little bit. You, you on the right track. There's an expression you just used. I, uh, wealth coach. Is wealth that what you coach, call what you do? Yes. You're more a coach than an advisor. I am more, yes. I am an accredited financial counselor, but a wealth coach because my goal is to actually help people who have high income but low net worth achieve that high net worth as well. So really working, especially with women who are high earners and looking to get to that next level, but they're not really sure how, how to actually get started. So helping them establish that base, that foundation, identifying their goals and how to start investing so that they can reach those goals. Have the conversation. Let, let's have it right now. She's a high net worth person, but she's not sure what to do. All right. What do you tell her to do? So, well, the first thing I would do is ask Shay, what does she want to do? Short, medium, and long-term goals. So I would say, let's just pick a medium-term goal. Is there something that you're working towards on a medium-term goal? And... I don't know if she's going to answer it for me right now. <laughs> but is, is the idea, I want to be making X number of dollars by the time I'm X number of years old? Is that what you mean? Uh, it's typically finding out the way that they're spending their cash flow, right? Cash flow in, cash flow out. I like to work off the 50, 30, 20 rule. What does that which refer is to? 50% of their income should be going towards fixed expenses. 20% uh, should be going towards their fixed savings and investment goals, and then 30% towards their discretionary income. So I actually have something called an anti-budget calculator because I think that 30% can sit off to the side, and as long as you've got that allocated, it's not necessary to have to check every single you know, time that you're spending. Coming back to that mindset I was talking about at the beginning, it's about a spending plan. So if you've got that 50% locked in with your fixed expenses and your 20% with your future self, Go and have fun. Go do whatever you want with fun. that 30%. Yes, that's for living life, and that's how you can manage it. What do you do, Kingsley, with... I mean, obviously, there are going to be some people watching this or listening to this who are saying, you know, that 50% of fixed costs for me is not really 50. It's more like 99. Yeah. And I have nothing left at the end. I can't save. I, I don't have discretionary income to have fun with. What do you say to them? Yeah, I think, I think it's honestly reviewing all the expenses... That, that you have and really understanding whether that 90% is 
is all fixed, right? I, I would argue that mm. you probably, when you take a good look, not all 90% is a fixed, fixed income. So one is you know, looking at it and see how much you can cut off. The other one is what are other ways to save? Right? Is, is there things that you can do uh, uh, that actually get your dollar to go further every time? Right? Like there, there's, you know, if you are on top of your finances, you, you're not racking up credit card, you're paying off your credit card every, every month. Using a credit card can get you a lot of loyalty points and that mm -hmm. helps you and, and earn a few bucks here and there as you're spending to make your money go further. Right? Mm -hmm. So some of those will be, will be helpful and how do we get those? But those are marginal gains. The, the most important part is looking at what you can cut, and, and it might be an uncomfortable conversation, but a, a, mm. a needed conversation to get a hold of your finances. Mm. But I'm gathering, Shay, that you're not necessarily dealing with, pe you're dealing with people with money, right? You're not dealing with people who, who are in a difficult spot and really don't have any savings at the end of the month. Is that so fair to both. say? both. Both. I okay. do deal with a lot of people who, d like, they are broke, for lack of better mm -hmm. terms, and, um, broke but have room to improve so it could be mismanaging their money um but i do have situations where some people are just not making enough income and um that could be whether they are just comfortable in their job or they don't know how to take the next step or maybe they're considering starting a business and they just haven't taken that step yet but yeah i definitely deal with people who have a lot of debt um who aren't making enough to to deal with those debts and now it's a situation of okay you either need to make more income or if you can't cut expenses, how do we deal with this debt? You know, whether that's consolidation, consumer proposal, and there is a lot of pushback on those things because there's an impact on your credit. And I always tell people, look, like, doing this is going to allow you to pay off the debt faster. And honestly, improving your credit is not that hard. Like, sometimes you have to make a sacrifice, and I personally would make the sacrifice of a good credit score to get rid of debt faster. Mm -hmm. so. I, I want to know, Stephanie, how you have that conversation with somebody that goes like this. Given how much you're spending, and given what you're, what's in your 30%, you really like to go out and have a good time from time to time, <laughs> you need to get a better job. You need to go out and make more money. How do you tell people that? Usually we start with having the conversation about where they're at in their career and what their future goals are for their career. Sometimes it does come down to negotiating a higher uh, income, finding a new job, because it is a honest conversation that does come up, which is you might have to be earning more or you might have to go back to school. There's going to be other factors if you're going to invest in yourself first before you start to um, invest in other areas of your life. Usually investing in yourself to gain that higher income is sometimes a solution as well. I presume you give different advice to somebody who's 27 as opposed to somebody who's 58. How does the advice differ? <laughs> uh, usually, somebody who's in the later years of their life, they're looking already at decumulation. How are they going to start drawing on their save savings and investments to supplement their retirement? And those who are in their early 20s or mid-20s are have the entire years ahead of them to start building that wealth. So they're in a very good situation. I always say, you know, it's just... The, Start today. Just start today, no matter what, because time is on your side when it comes to investing. That's what I want to know. How do you mm -hmm. convince a 27-year-old that someday, 50 years from now, you're going to want to retire, maybe 40? You're going show to show them the numbers. You're you have to, to retire. You just show them the numbers. <laughs> show them the numbers and how much uh, compound interest can really make it's a, a beautiful thing, in isn't it? I love it. I love it. And you really can convince a 27-year-old to put a little bit aside and usually save every the month? usually the woman that I'm working with. Yes, they see the potential in the future, and they're they're typically high achievers, and they're looking for that next. Next hmm. level, yeah. Kingsley, we I mean, inflation, thankfully, is starting to mm -hmm. get down a little bit, uh, but it's certainly the highest it's been in 40 years. How do, you, how do you advise people to navigate around the inflationary times in which we live? Yeah, it's, it's a challenging environment. We're seeing headline news on groceries, rents all, all going up. I think in a high interest rate environment, the number one thing is reduce your debt. Right? Mm. because you, you're being charged interest on those debts, so every dollar go into reducing that debt is, is important. I think second, second of all is you know, investing in your future, like Stephanie said, right? Like if, if you are with an uh, employer and they do co-investing in terms of a dollar that you put in, they put in a dollar to invest in your future, maximize that, and, and that's going to help you to build the, the fund in a few, uh, later in life. And lastly is also a, how do you set up a rainy day fund, right? Mm. On average, three to six months of... of, of of your income and set it aside in case something happened, you have some financial buffer to help you to 
to get through that, really. So those are the three things okay. that... Okay, I saw some numbers mm -hmm. not too long ago that said something like 80% of Canadians don't have a rainy day fund. Mm -hmm. That if they get hit with a disaster, you know, 80% of people don't have three to six months income sitting in a bank account ready to help out. How do they start? Yeah, you know, taking the small step to start looking at your plan mm -hmm. and start putting savings in there. It could be a, you know, bank the rest product. For example, you spend 525, the remaining 75 cents will go into your saving accounts, right? So every little uh, one counts. It's about habit and behaviors. How do you automate that and, and start going by little, little? It might seem a, a big challenge to get to one month buffer. You can start somewhere. It may take you a couple months to get to one month and, and slowly build that up. It's, it's about taking the first step to start. Stephanie, we're in our last minute here. Can people really save during these kinds of inflationary times? I think so. Absolutely. It comes down to establishing those healthy financial habits, understanding your relationship with money, and making the conscious choice to do better. So, absolutely. Do you have to kind of... What's the age at which people should start to have some kind of understanding that uh, being smart financially is a worth... Is the thing worth doing? I think starting with your kids, to be honest. As soon as they're able to open up a bank account or do anything, talk to them, have the money conversations, help them understand the value of a dollar and what that really means to them because it will help them establish and learn from your healthy money habits too. Help them establish a healthy financial future as well. And a good bank account should be opened at what age? Oh, gosh, I started really young with my children. I started when they were five. They no had kidding. their own bank account, yes. yes and, and they got it? Uh, yeah, well, I'm the co-signer. Oh, the, <laughs> <laughs> and the coach, too. Right? Yeah, forget yeah. that. Okay, great. That's Stephanie Wolf. She is with Wolf Collective Wealth. She's a certified financial coach. We thank her for being here today, along with Kingsley Chack, Senior VP, Deposit Savings and Investments at Scotiabank, and Shay Myers, Finance for the Culture, is what she's all about. My thanks to you three for coming into TVO tonight. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, March 15th, 2023, the 2067th anniversary of the assassination of Julius Caesar in the Senate House in Rome. Beware the Ides of March. My old Latin teacher would be glad I mentioned this tonight. Public libraries emerged from COVID lockdowns with a renewed set of priorities, and we'll find out about those tomorrow. Also, we'll debate some surprising findings about mental health and the pandemic. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.